Hello, I'm Valerie Pierre. The coronavirus has opened up our eyes to another pandemic, that of misinformation. The term fake news doesn't do it justice, and it's a genre that's mutating. Whether it's a piece of misinformation that's placed to pick up and innocently be shared to friends on social media, or malinformation, a new story promising a virus cure that's designed to harm or defraud people instead, none of it is good news. And we all look to our governments to help protect us against this infodemic. Today on IOHR TV, I'm joined by Damien Collins, member of the UK Parliament for Folkestone and High since 2010. Damien was the chairman of the Digital, Culture, Media and Sport Select Committee for three years until November 2019. He oversaw the committee's disinformation and fake news inquiry. During the coronavirus epidemic, Damien has co-founded Infotasian, a web fact checking service to fight the spread of misinformation about coronavirus and hosts a podcast about disinformation, which has attracted huge numbers of followers. Damien Collins, thank you so much for joining us today on IOWatch RTV. From leading the disinformation fake news inquiry when you were the chairman of the Digital Cultural Media and Sports Select Committee to launching Infotation, you've been standing up against disinformation for a long time. Why? Well, um, we, I did a lot of work on looking at disinformation as part of the uh, Select Committee inquiry on disinformation and fake news. So I was aware of many of the issues and what really struck me during the, the, the early phase of the coronavirus uh, uh, lockdown in particular was, you know, people were sharing lots of information through social networking groups, through WhatsApp and other messaging services. I think people had a default uh, to, to thinking, well, if someone sent me something and I think it looks important, I'll share it with my friends and people I know just in case it's true. And often what, what, what I was seeing just in my own sort of friends and family groups was people were sharing stuff that wasn't true. And I thought we need ways and places where people um, can get stuff checked, where they can easily screenshot and submit something for checking. They can see a, a fact check based on something that they've seen or someone else has seen. And they can easily share that information back through their networks and with coronavirus being something that is important because it's um, public health emergency, um, and but it's also new. There, there was lots of um, things we didn't know about. We still don't know about coronavirus. We set up Infotagen in response to that, and we and we set up um, set it up with a team of people who um, their background was in in sort of pub social media publishing. So they came to it not from a policy or a political point of view, but from a background of how you try and get people to engage with ideas and issues online. So that was how we started Infotagion. And then the podcast series started after that, because I sort of feel that uh, whilst there's an immediate need to try and make sure people can get accurate information and check what they see, there is uh, this is taking place in the middle of a very big public policy debate about you know, what are the responsibilities of social media companies to act against harmful content? How should the government respond to that? What innovations are there within the tech sector to try and help us more readily identify harmful content. What we wanted to do with the podcast was really extend that in, extend that uh, conversation and make it one that other people could listen to and join in. What has Invitation brought to the public notice that, that might have been lost otherwise? I think what, what we lost is a sense of there are there are ideas about what you can do about this. You know, so that there are some people some people some people might think, well, you know, there are billions of views, billions of views on social media sharing things all the time. How could you possibly go about trying to trying to police that or regulate that but you know but there are ways in which you can um, you know people might think that in terms of data policy that you know is there really any alternative to uh, to people having to give up their data in order to use internet tools and services for free um, you know are the, how do you get you know, what are the signs of disinformation that you can learn to spot if you're if you're a consumer and, and therefore how you know, what should you question I think it's that debate is really important because I, I think if we go back two or three years, we weren't asking these sorts of questions. Um, and people, I think, were more accepting of what they saw online and, and didn't question the role of the social media companies as much. Now they do. And I think that's a, a consequence of the work that's been done. I think it's really important that debate is continued. You've made recommendations before that education and schools should also include 
teaching kits to help kids be aware of the information that they're getting and really to arm them against disinformation. How do you think that's working and what else can be done? When I was chairman of the select committee, one of our recommendations was that, um, that as banks do, um, banks make a contribution towards financial education and financial literacy as part of education, that the tech companies should do the same uh, for schools as well. That in some ways we need to, and I've seen some really great stuff that some of the tech companies have developed um, being rolled out in schools in my constituency. But um, I think we need to look at how, how can we generally fund more literacy training for, for children in particular to understand how they can keep themselves safe online uh, and uh, how to look out for and spot and check for information that might not be true. And so I think it's a question of funding that and designing the tools. You've previously said that platforms should have more responsibility when it comes to tackling this infodemic. What can they do? There is, you know, if we want people to keep themselves safe and avoid sharing or, or engaging with harmful content or, or dishonest content, we need to, I think, look at what tools can be developed to help that as well. What tools can be developed to help flag content that most likely comes from a, a source that shouldn't be trusted? And um, and that, that, I think, is important too. And I think, again, the role, the tech companies can play a role in helping to create those tools because sometimes disinformation is hard to spot and we're not very good at giving people clues for how they can spot it. What kind of frameworks can we introduce to ensure that media platforms do mediate and control disinformation when they find it? So I think there, are, there are two things we can do about that. One thing the UK government has already done is to try and have a, a form of rapid response unit that seeks to counter false news by spreading the official news and information so people are more aware of that. The other thing I think in terms of looking at disinformation is to try and uh, say, well, how can we identify these known sources of, of disinformation? How can we disrupt the dissemination of, of lies, particularly if they're, if they're harmful? And I think one of the things we'd like to see the tech companies do more of is to learn the, and ident to identify sources of disinformation and to flag those and where, and where that content is harmful to, to remove it, to make sure that um, this cannot be done as easily in the future as, it is, as it's been doing now. Um, I think on Facebook in particular, groups with hundreds of thousands of users in them uh, that are, and they use those networks to disseminate false stories freely and I think again we should look at how we can disrupt these networks where it can be shown that the content they're, they're promoting is harmful. Some governments have already introduced laws against fake news and then face backlash that they could be used to stifle freedom of expression. What do you think governments should or shouldn't do to tackle disinformation? Um, in France, they have a they have a, a law which gives the power to a judge uh, to rule something as being disinformation during an, an election period. The, the role that I would I think would work better, I think, is based on a model we already have for broadcasting, and that is that we have an independent regulator that can make decisions on harmful content and disinformation, just as Ofcom, the media regulator, does on things like uh, balance and taste and decency for the broadcasting sector. Parliament can create a code and um, but, but it should be for an independent regulator to turn that into a, an ongoing code of practice um, that, as in the broadcasting sector, Ofcom doesn't, doesn't, doesn't pre-check broadcast material before it is shown. That's the, res the responsibility of the broadcasters to make sure they comply with the code, but a regulator can step in if it feels that they've, they've done something wrong. And, and I think with, with harmful disinformation, um, what, a, what a regulator could do is if something had been spreading through the internet and we really feel that um, the social media company should have challenged that or done something about it, then um, the regulator should have the power to go in and audit well, what went wrong, uh, why wasn't this spotted, what action should the company have taken and given it guidance and, and ultimately have powers to, to take steps against the company if it had failed to act. Now I think there are, there's always been a tension between freedom of speech and the harm that speech can cause other people. Um, and I think people have a right to express themselves and freedom, and they have the right to be freedom of expression. But does that extend to having the right to using the, the um, algorithms of social media to promote that message to millions of people? You know, and I think it's it's that promotion and the boosting and the curating of that content that ultimately the social media company is responsible for is the thing we should call into question. And I think that then should be greater scrutiny in particular of people who are influencers on social media, people who have very big audiences who effectively use social media as a broadcasting platform, but use it to do and say things you'd never be allowed to do on a radio show. But ultimately, I think it should be 
the, the oversight of that, I think, should be, should be down to independent bodies, not down to government ministers. The European Commission recently proposed a set of new actions aimed at tackling disinformation and named and shamed Russia and, for the first time, China. What do you think is the best way to counter hostile states in this arena? What, what can we do? Well, um, the, we, can, we can set our own policies on this. I mean, there's no, there, there hasn't before been a sort of unified European policy on, on dealing with harmful content. And different European countries have already started doing their own thing. So, as I, as I said, obviously France has its election laws on disinformation. Uh, Germany has, its, um, has obviously brought its, its hate speech laws into the social media space as well and takes enforcement action against social media companies for not removing content that breaks their hate speech rules. So, so, so we can do that. And in the UK, um, we've been looking at both through the online harms uh, white paper and also the review of electoral law, how we similarly create our own rules for, um, uh, for, you know, for you know, to, to, well, the online harms can look to create responsibilities for tech companies to act against content that bre you know, breaches electoral law and breaches um, you know, whatever code we put in place for harmful content as well. So that is something we can certainly continue with. Um, I think it's again we are we are mindful now of the threat coming of disinformation coming in an organised way from um, state organisations and this being used in some ways as a weapon that disinformation is, and during the Cold War was recognised as being a weapon that the Soviets used. Uh, we saw the sort of the Salisbury poisoning um, of the Skripal family that. Um, there were lots of counter narratives being put out from Russian sources, and this was being done to not necessarily to prove a different narrative was true, but to leave people in a position where they didn't know what to believe um, and, and to try and sh deliberately show confusion. I think we've seen with, with China and disinformation around coronavirus an attempt to try and um, confuse people about whether the wet market in Wuhan is really the real source of coronavirus or whether it's come from somewhere else to create the impression that this is disputed. The Commission also stated that online platforms should provide monthly data reports that include detailed data on their actions, what have they done to promote authoritative content, improve user awareness, limit coronavirus advertising related rubbish. Do you, do you think it's working? Well, I mean, I think that that's where you get into what, what, is, what is the system of oversight um, and why we need an independent regulated to oversee these things because otherwise we can we can ask the companies whatever we like they're not necessarily under any legal obligation to comply and we don't want to be in a position where we're then we then we have to take their word for it that the information they've given is gives you the full picture and that's why i think it is important that there are systems which would allow an independent body to come in and inspect what was going on if there were concerns legitimate concerns that have been raised and audits what's going on we have the information commissioner in the uk has that power uh, as a consequence of the um, GDPR data protection legislation, we don't have the same sort of power over content. And I think that's really, really important. So that's why I think the we, what we need to make sure is that there are um, proper systems in place that allow us to, if we set standards to the tech companies, to properly audit them as to whether they are complying properly. Social media platforms are international. So where do you think we should bring together international legislation? Uh, really just to start to combat fake news. Do you think that's the role for UNESCO, other parts of the UN, parts of the EU? How do governments bring that together with civil society's help, if possible, without it becoming onerous? It'll, it'll always probably be for national parliaments or in Europe, probably the European Commission, to, to play a role in driving policy forward. But part of that debate is informed by what other countries are doing. So, you know, it's interesting to look at what's happening in Australia in terms of you know, imposing responsibility, greater responsibilities on tech companies and and also, you know, better financial support for the sharing of news content, you know, to look at what's happening in Germany in terms of the hate speech laws, because people say, well, can you actually do this? Well, you say, well, in Germany they do, they enforce laws around hate speech and, and standards on the tech companies through that. Um, you know, people always say, well, what can you do about freedom of speech in countries like America, where it's very difficult to regulate speech, but there's actually a very live, very active debate with very strong opinions in, on different sides of that argument in America, and clearly there there are there are different ways you can approach that even within their their constitutional framework. So I think as we think about how we develop policy and how we respond to this, it's it's very helpful to be able to draw on the debate that's taking place around the world. What comes next for you in the next six months? 
Well, I mean, um, the I'm looking forward to Parliament being, I think, fully back once the social distancing restrictions are lifted, as I'm sure most people are looking forward to their their working life going back to something like normal. Um, and it's going to be clearly a very challenging time as we look to rebuild the economy and society after the virus is under control and, and eliminated from our lives. So uh, that is very important. And I will continue to remain in Parliament very actively engaged in policy issues around this. And I think that we look forward to continuing our work with Infotagion, both through the fact checking and through the podcast to make sure that um, people are can, be, can join in and be part of this debate about how we make social media a safer space and how we you know, protect citizens rights, both in terms of uh, their right to be seen and heard and also their rights over their data. Damien Collins, thank you so much for joining us on IHR TV and we look forward to hearing how you continue with Infotagion and really standing up for disinformation for everyone. Thank you very much. From me, Valerie Pierre, it's been a pleasure having you on IHR TV and we look forward to having you here next time.